Hello everyone. It is Saturday, I believe the 11th of September, a very solemn day um, in American history, but things go on. We must uh, remember what happened this day back in 2001, but we must also get on with the business of fighting for liberty. So we decided to go ahead and do this training today um, out of respect for those who uh, were sacrificed, uh, not only during the Twin Tower attack, but also in the wars that followed and uh, the sacrifices that people continue to make in our struggle uh, for liberty. Um, again, my name is Richard Burke. I'm executive director of the Western Liberty Network. This is the latest in an ongoing series of Saturday Zoom trainings designed to give limited government grassroots activists the skills they need to be politically successful. Um, I'm on the road today, which is why I'm doing this training from the car. And uh, my computer doesn't allow me to uh, bring up the Western Liberty Network website, but I will briefly describe that. You can go to the Western Liberty Network website by going to westernliberty.com or westernlibertynetwork.org. And on the front page, you'll find out what's happening right now. Um, we have a conference coming up on February 4th that I'd like you to uh, register for if you decide you want to go to that. We have 20 breakout sessions uh, during this time. You'll learn lots of skills that you'll need for 2023. Uh, we have 3,500 positions coming up in Oregon in May of 2023, and the legislature is going to be in session. There's going to be a lot to do in Washington State, so please check that out on the main page. Uh, on the training page, you'll find a bunch of resources, including training document sheets, uh, and also videos, including this video that'll be posted in the next day or two. Um, that, you know, with the documents and the videos, you can actually design your own personal uh, training. And as we approach the November election, that's the asset for one who's going to be politically active. Um, also, I want to point out that Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 organization. That means by law, we're not allowed to endorse or oppose any candidate or political party. We don't do that. And neither do we endorse legislation or ballot measures, although we do train limited government grassroots activists how to be effective in the campaigns they care about. <clears throat> and of course, we support generally limited government principles. Uh, statements made by people in this, in this uh, training session are completely their own, do not necessarily reflect the views of Western Europe. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Jennifer, Donna, and Sandra to this training session. This is an interactive session, which means if you want to at any time, unmute your microphone. And if you have a question, interrupt me. Or if you have a comment, go ahead and feel free to interject. And uh, we'll go back and forth. This makes it a much spicier uh, session for the people who watch the recording. And actually, more people watch the recordings than watch the live session. So. I want to thank those of you who are participating today and also thank those of you who will be watching in the recordings. Uh, this session is on how to be effective in informal debates. During political season, you're going to find yourself involved in a lot of informal debates. If you're a candidate, you might find yourself interviewing with a newspaper reporter uh, who challenges your views. You might be uh, on a radio talk show host. You might be doing a uh, uh, public access thing with the League of Women Voters, or you might be in an actual candidate debate. If you are an activist and you're doing door knocking, you might find yourself in a discussion with someone at the door, uh, or you know maybe just talking with someone at a diner or a restaurant. How do you be persuasive? And of course, that's the challenge. It's not just winning the argument on points. Uh, a lot of times it's easy to win the arguments on points, especially if you know your facts and you've got good ideas and you're well grounded. But it's not enough to just win on points. You can win an argument, but alienate the person or the people that you're trying to persuade. So the trick is to win the argument, but in a way that persuades people to come to your side and does not necessarily alienate people who you need to come your way in order to be successful. So there are some tips. Um, the first tip is to one, identify your audience. Hold on a second, I'm gonna let Connie come in. Hello, Connie, thank you for joining us today. Um, you're just in time. 
uh, if you want to interject or ask a question anytime during this session, feel free to unmute your microphone and do so. So uh, I was just getting into the meat of the training after some introductory comments. Uh, if you want to see those, you can check the recording. It'll be up uh, tomorrow. Uh, we lost somebody, but that's okay. Maybe we'll get them back. Anyhow, the first point was to identify your audience. It isn't always obvious who your audience is. For example, I've seen people who are candidates be on a radio interview, and they're trying to persuade the person who is interviewing them. Uh, this is usually a mistake. It's not the uh, job of the people interviewing you, whether it be a newspaper reporter or a talk show host, to be publicly persuaded. They're there to challenge you. Your audience is not them. Instead, your audience is really the people who are listening to the radio or the people who are reading the newspaper, <coughs> generally not the reporter or the interviewer themselves. Likewise, if you are at a diner having a discussion with someone, you'll find that quite often the person who is your real audience is not the person you're talking to at the diner, but the several people who are around them listening to you. And uh, the same is true of if you're in a candidate debate or in a group setting. Always try to be mindful of who your audience is. And when you realize that your audience is not the person you're actually speaking with, Use the person you're speaking with sort of as a foil to make your points to the other people. Uh, kind of like I notice that um, at some times of the year at a lot of churches, the pastor or the priest will ask the uh, um, children to come up. And there'll be a sermon ostensibly for the children, but it's really not for the children. It's for the parents. And uh, uh, children may benefit from it, but the parents are really who the target is. Uh, likewise, if you're talking to a group of people, get an idea of who your audience is, not just who you're talking to. If you are in a debate setting uh, with an opponent and you know who your audience is and the other person hasn't taken the time to really think that through, you're already at an automatic advantage. Another thing I try to get folks to do is to always, always be nice. This isn't an era in civic life where civility is particularly valued and a lot of people are you know very nasty to each other and it's almost expected that if you don't agree with someone folks might think of you as the enemy rather than just an opponent or just someone with a, a different point of view and it's easy to lose your temper how many times have you been in a debate and you've heard someone say or maybe you yourself have said how could you be so stupid why can't you understand that this is true you know, you guys are just completely dense. You guys are crazy. It must be a mental illness. Uh, you have TDS or whatever it is. And in those instances, if you've ever heard people say that, or if you've ever said that yourself, you might you might well be right. But uh, you're not going to persuade people by calling them crazy or stupid or any of those things. All you're going to do is force them to build a camp, and you're going to build a camp. No one's going to be persuaded, and people on the outside are going to think, uh, that both of you are jerks. Uh, and you don't want to do that. I often point out that in small claims court, if you've ever been to small claims court, people sometimes make the mistake of doing all kinds of legal research, finding case precedents, and building a brief for the judge. Uh, and, you know, in regular court, that's what lawyers do. But in small claims court, that's usually a mistake. In a small claims court, regardless of who is right or who is wrong, most of the time, the judge will side with whoever is the least jerk, whoever the nicest person is, whoever the most likable person is, whoever the most sympathetic person is, they're the person that wins. And when you're in an informal debate, if you're in a, a radio interview, a newspaper interview, uh, or if you're having a discussion at a diner, or even a family debate at the Thanksgiving Day table, if you are the likable one, you are the gracious one if you are the nice one and the other person loses their temper most of the time you're the winner even if you're weaker on the facts even if you're technically not the debate winner you will win as people you know as victory being defined by people being brought to your side if you are the nice person the reasonable person the likable person and so it's important to always be nice be clear on your facts be firm, 
you know, don't don't waffle or or be submissive, but be nice and polite all the time. Even if you're prodded, even if they poke you with a stick, always be nice. Let them, your opponent, let them be the one that comes off as the jerk, and you're going to find yourself a winner in almost every case. Even in presidential debates, um, you know, I supported Donald Trump in 2020, but that first debate, he came off looking like a jerk, in my opinion. Um, and if he was just less, uh, I think if he was less aggressive, it would have served him in much better stead. And then following debates, uh, he was less aggressive. Uh, but even at the present, if you're nice and gracious, it will pay dividends. Along with that, I like to train people to believe that most of the time, your opponent is not your enemy. Now, I take a look at people like, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi, um, Chuck Schumer. Those kind of people, in my opinion, want power over people. In my view, mo that, that is evil. I think that they're more interested in power than they are in freedom. These are my opinions uh, about you know, some folks who love big government. And such people are an enemy. Um, but your average person who lives in your neighborhood, who might be liberal or, or might support big government, most of them are not evil. Most of them are decent people. They mow their grass. They love their kids. They're participating in the neighborhood watch, whatever it is. Now, in my opinion, such people are wrong, they're misguided, some of them are confused, they don't have the facts, um, or they don't care about the facts, and, and that's one thing. But they're not innately evil, they're not trying to destroy freedom, they're just misguided, and even with the best intentions, they're going the wrong way. And so it's important to remember that, in, except in very rare cases, your opponent is not your enemy. And if you could remember that, that maybe they're your opponent, but you're not, they're not your enemy, it makes it a lot easier to be nice when debating them. Again, be nice, be professional, but you know, don't be submissive, don't give ground uh, you know, when you think you're right, but be nice, be professional, be cordial, be gracious. Sometimes if things get out of hand, sometimes an opponent will lose their temper. And they'll say, oh, you, you don't care about anybody. You only care about yourselves. You don't want to pay taxes. You just, don't, you just don't care if grandma dies and gets thrown into the snow. You know, if someone gets really upset like that, and there are people that are listening, it's perfectly okay to say, you know what? I know we disagree, but I didn't mean to upset you. You know, if you want, we can continue this at another time. Maybe we both need to cool down a little bit. You're going to be seen as the gracious one. You're going to be seen as the magnanimous one and you know if it gets to the point where you have to say something like that you've probably already won people over if they've lost their temper and you've kept yours and you show some compassion for them by saying look you know i just wanted to debate the issue with you i know we disagree but i didn't mean to upset you this way it makes you look like you care about the other person and uh with a little bit of grace and compassion people will tend to side with you or even uh, you know, change their minds because they like you. When Ronald Reagan was elected president, most people actually didn't agree with him on the issues. Remember when people thought that he was going to be crazy and hit the nuclear button back in 1980? I don't know, maybe none of you are old enough to remember that. I'm showing my, I'm dating myself here. But people voted for him. They voted for him because they thought he was genuine. They thought he was sincere. They thought he, they could trust him to sit, do what he's going to, what he says that he's going to do. He was likable. And likewise, uh, Bill Clinton, you know, who I oppose politically in almost every way. A lot of people who didn't agree with him on issues uh, voted for him. And when they were polled on why, the answer was because he understands problems of people like me. So remember that if you're in a debate with someone and you're passionate, you know, you're compassionate and you're looking out for them and you're likable, you're going to win. Now you'll notice I haven't talked at all about policy. You know, what I'm talking about here are, you know, setting the conditions for victory. 
um, you know, Sun Tzu in the Art of War was all about that. He was like, you know, most battles are decided before they are ever fought because of the parameters around which, you know, the battle takes place. And so look at what you've done. You've identified your audience and you're always professional. You see your opponent as an opponent and not your enemy. Okay, this positions you for victory. Now, naturally, you want to be well informed on the issues you're debating about. You want to be quick to understand what the opponent's arguments are. It's important to listen to your opponent's arguments with sincerity and respond to them accordingly. Uh, and, and that's all very important. But winning people over, winning their hearts, is often not about the facts. It is usually about uh, personality and emotion, emotional issues. So identify your audience. Always be nice, no matter what. Understand that you're put. That's sorry. That's that's my dog Aria back there, and my wife Natasha. Uh, <clears throat> and another thing. Remember that you don't have to know everything. There are going to be times when your opponent brings up an issue that maybe you don't have a good answer for. Uh, maybe that you don't. You know, they bring up a question that you don't know the answer to. If that happens, don't try to bluff your way through or fake your way through um, or bluster your way through. People can always tell. Uh, they might not be able to identify the specific claim you're making that represents blustering through, but they will feel it. Uh, people have very good sensitivity to that. It's perfectly all right to say, you know something? I hadn't thought of that before, and I don't know the answer to that. What I'd like to do is think about it for a while and maybe get back to you tomorrow with a, a better, you know, with a better response. And uh, if you do that, people who are in your audience, they'll generally respect it. They will generally respect it at the very least, even if it costs you that battle, even if you should know something that you don't, and even if it costs you that battle, the fact that you're not BSing your way through it the fact that you're not blustering your way through it it's going to give you credibility and believability and the next time you're in a discussion you're going to have that capital to fall back on um, and you're also going to appear thoughtful and it's going to be clear that you listen with intent and these things are all all things that speak to credibility and as you Go through the years in your activism, you're going to find that your credibility is one of your most important assets. So if you don't know the answer to something, it's okay to admit it. It's okay to say, I don't know. Interesting point. I'll get back to you on that. I'll think about it. And on very rare occasions, they may be right and you may be persuaded by them. And if that's how you really feel about it, there's nothing wrong. <clears throat> that's how things are supposed to work in a democratic republic for a constitutional republic. Uh, but uh, most of the time that's not going to happen because, you know, if like me, uh, you believe that limited government answers to problems are generally the most, uh, are generally the most uh, productive and inspirational uh, ways to approach different problems. So, uh, but once in a while you might be persuaded and that's okay. Um, another item, look for common values and outcomes. If, for example, I am debating somebody on student choice, if I'm debating someone on student choice, I'm going to try to get my opponent to agree to, something, agree to a metric. I might say, you know something, we have different approaches. I like school choice, you like government schools, but we both want the same thing, right? We want to have the most children educated as well as possible to prepare them for life in a cost-effective way. Do you agree with that? Um, I don't know anyone who's not going to agree with that, but get them to agree to some outcome, some shared outcome. Uh, we want people to think independently. We want people to have the basic skills. We want people to do, you know, whatever it is, get your opponent to agree on those things. Uh, for example, uh, another example is if you're talking about taxes, you can say, you know, even liberals don't like waste. 
So let's talk about the most efficient ways. We both want government services to be provided, you know, in a cost effective way, right? Right. Okay. If you can get people to agree to a metric, then you've usually got, them because then you can say, okay, now that we agree on an outcome, let's take a look at our two approaches and see historically which approach does better at meeting that outcome. Okay. If you're able to get to that point, you're probably going to win the debate if you're sure about your facts. And it doesn't create overt hostility because your opponent has agreed with the metric that you propose. Now, again, look at what we've done. We've identified a specific audience. We've made a determination to always be nice and gracious no matter what. We realize that our opponent, although our opponent is not our enemy, and that you don't have to know everything and that you've gotten them to agree on a common outcome, some desirable outcome that both of you want, even though you want to go about it in different ways. Um, that goes a long way to positioning yourself for persuasiveness and victory in any debate. The next point I would say that when you're debating an issue, frame the discussion by determining what your core value is. If you are in favor of school choice, your core value might be freedom for choice. Um, if you're a pro-government school person, your goal might be, your simple goal might be equity, okay? Think about what your core value is, and then try to frame the discussion by establishing, you know, some value. I'll give you an example. Let's say there is a, a debate, and I like to use this example. I think Donna's heard me use it before. You, you have a debate over whether or not candy is good or bad. And on one side, you've got the president of Hershey, okay? Hershey, not surprisingly, says, of course candy is good. You know, it allows us to mark events in a sweet way. It is, you know, given as a token of love. Uh, children love it. It puts a smile on your face. It brightens up your day. And uh, so happiness is the core value. And you should determine who wins this debate based on which side provides you with more happiness. Yes, candy or no candy. Yes, candy provides more happiness, so you should support candy. Okay, on the other side, you've got the head of the American Dental Association. He goes, well, it's tempting and candy has its positive side, but it's bad. It causes cavities, it causes diabetes, it shortens lives, it causes heart problems. Health should be your core function, okay? And because candy is bad for your health, you should vote that candy is bad. So you see in both sides, they've set a value, happiness or health. And they've said that you should, reasons why you should consider that value as the primary value in deciding who wins the debate. When you're in any discussion, even if it's a family discussion, if your 17-year-old boy wants to borrow the car keys, you know, his central issue is going to be freedom or maybe convenience, claiming he can run errands for you. But your central value is maybe going to be safety. You know, I don't trust your skills yet. You don't have a license yet. Uh, those kind of things. Uh, safety versus freedom. Uh, in government schools, it might be equity versus freedom of choice. In taxes, it might be uh, freedom and efficiency versus equity, whatever it is. Both sides are going to have a core value. And if you can identify what your core value is in anything that you're debating, and you focus your argumentation around promoting those values, and telling people why they should consider your value as the primary way to make a decision, then you're going to do very well. Are there any questions so far? Any questions or comments? Okay. Okay, another thing I, I train people to do is put your best arguments first. In baseball, they like to put their weaker hitters up first, second, third, and then have their big hitter run fourth. So in case you get all of them on first base, your big hitter can hit a home run and can hit a grand slam. Um, that's how you know people do things. And, and in, in debating, sometimes people like to say, I've got three, four arguments. 
I'm going to save my best one for last as a gotcha. And I advise people against doing that. In journalism, they call that burying the lead. You are burying the best thing underneath a bunch of other things. A lot of times, if you're in a radio interview, maybe your audience can't listen. Uh, if you're being interviewed by a newspaper, most people only read the first paragraph of the newspaper article. Um, and people usually only, only listen to the beginning of a conversation. So always put your best argument first, your next best argument second, and so on and so on, so that you're always leading with your strongest argument in a debate. And then finally, thank your opponent and audience for their attention. Show them some respect and show them some grace. You can say to your opponent something like, you know, I realize we don't agree on these things, but that's okay. I respect your uh, civic engagement and I want to thank you for uh, your interaction with me today. Or if you've got an audience, I also like to thank you for paying attention, investing some of your time and listening to us discuss these issues. Or thank you for listening on the radio broadcast. It's always good to show some grace after that. And, you know, I'm not guaranteeing that you're going to win every discussion and every debate all the time. But if you can identify your audience, if you're always nice and gracious, but firm, um, if you realize that your opponent is not your enemy and you don't take it personally, you don't try to BS your way through situations where you don't know everything. It's okay to acknowledge that. If you frame the debate by uh, getting your opponent to agree to specific outcomes, that you can then compare methods to achieve those outcomes um, and uh, frame the discussion based on a key core value. And if you put your best arguments first and show some grace by thanking your audience and your opponent, you are going to do very well in discussions and debates. Even if you make a mistake here and there, you will build goodwill that translates into persuasive power. Uh, hold on a second here. Someone's coming in late. Caleb, um, you just came into the discussion, but we're almost finished. I want to let you know that uh, sometime tomorrow evening, this session will be recorded and put up on the training tab of the Western Liberty Network dot org website so you'll be able to view this training uh, at a later time i am glad that you popped in i'm just sorry that you popped in a little bit late so i would like to ask jennifer sandra donna um, if you have any questions or comments and if you don't i'd like to ask you to pop on and tell me if you think this has been of value to you Hi, Richard. Sandra here. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very valuable as a reminder. I think most of us probably can say, you know, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. But sometimes we forget things that we should remember and keep at the front of our attention. And these are excellent. I wrote them down as you spoke, and I will review them before I before I go talk with people. Um, to try and persuade anybody. I think there are also times, though, when um, when we just don't have time to persuade people because, you know, we're going door to door, whatever, and we have to see a lot of other people. Or, uh, and I just, you know, I just listen, thank them for their time, and move on. <laughs> thank you very much, Sandra. Hi, Hi. this is uh, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, um, I thought it was very valuable. Um, and thank you so much, uh, particularly the part uh, where you said, put your best argument first. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it never occurred to me, I always end it with the best argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, always put your best argument first in the debate. Okay. Uh, it also has another effect as if it, if it is a compelling argument, sometimes it can put your opponent on their back heels. Oh, and sure. So, and, uh, um, mm -hmm. and when you deal with the second, third, fourth argument, they're less able to deal with it because they weren't able to deal with the first. And it might so, put them on the offense as well if they're yeah. not in agreement. So interesting. Now, I want you folks to know that on the westernlibertynetwork.org website, if you scroll down, there is a training document on this very topic. And it covers the things that I covered in this session today. 
Uh, you can download it free of charge. Just click on it when you find it, go to the training tab, scroll down to you see informal debates and click on it and you'll see a PDF that you can download, copy, do whatever it is that you want to do. Okay. So, um, does anyone else have anything to say for the good of the order? Well, once again, I want to thank you all for taking part. God bless you. Have a good week. Um, next week, I'm going to be doing a conference at the Shiloh Inn in Multnomah County. If you want to attend that, you can go to the westernlibertynetwork.org website. And on the homepage, there are two and there will soon be three conferences up. But this is the one at the Shiloh Inn um, in Multnomah County next Saturday. And uh, we'll be doing an entire day of training. Um, hope you can come to that. And of course, we've got our annual conference on February 4th. So uh, anyway, we won't be doing a uh, Zoom training next Saturday, but we will be resuming the following Saturday. So uh, I want to thank you all for participating. I want to thank those who are viewing the recording. Uh, God bless you, and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.